had waited for it for a long time. I was 21 years old, a little bit nervous. But when I stood at the front of that altar, dressed, all dressed up, and I saw, yeah, I saw her walk in the door. Man, was she a sight to see. That was my wife. She was about to become my wife. I was 21 years old. I was nervous. But as she walked in, my heart palpitated a little bit faster. I'm like, wow, I'm about to do this. This is a mega step in my life. And I stood before my father who married us and said, I do. I do. I do. And when we walked down that aisle, I was like, whoa, I'm married. I can't believe I'm married. This is awesome. It's a new chapter in my life. We went down the stairs of the church, that little church on 44th and Polina. They threw rice at us because back then you could throw rice. It was politically correct. Now it kills pigeons. But they threw rice at us. We walked down. We got into this limo, jumped in. I looked at her in the back. I said, we're married. We rolled down the windows and started driving through the neighborhood, and I couldn't take my eyes off of her. I can't believe that I got her. Wow, what was wrong with her? She must have not really seen who I was. I got her. As we drove through the neighborhood, drove past the house that she used to live in, beautiful June day, there was a guy in the corner with a paper bag. And as we stopped the car at the stop sign, I looked at him, he looked at me, He said, hey, buddy. I thought he was going to say congratulations with the paper bag in his hand, a little wobbly. He said, I feel sorry for you. You just made the worst decision of your whole life. And then we took off. Welcome to married life. That was my societal congratulations to married life. You know what? I didn't jump out of the car and ask this guy a story. But I bet you, if I would have jumped out of that car and sat down with that guy and said, tell me, why are you so mad about marriage? Why do you think it's the worst decision that he probably would have said to me? I tried it. It was a nightmare. It really bombed out. And I will never do it again. Because the truth is... That marriage in today's society is brutal. In fact, I know you know the statistics, but they tell us that one out of every other marriage gets a divorce. And another 50% of the people that say, I do, in a few years end up saying, I don't. Imagine being at a wedding ceremony and the pastor's there giving you your vows and he's saying, You're thinking, am I going to make it or not? It's like this, the pastor taking out a quarter and saying, let's see. Um, Yeah, you're going to make it. Let me see. No, you're not going to make it because that's the way it is. It's a 50-50 chance in our society. Some of you are here today. You've been through a brutal, nasty, difficult divorce, and you're still licking your wounds from the challenge that it is. Some of you are here today, and you're married, but you're saying, I don't know how much longer I'm going to stay married. And some of you are here today with a person that you have been dating for a decade, and you refuse to get married because you're scared to death about the possibility and the prospect of jumping into something that you will really really regret. And I want to say that it doesn't have to be that way. That yeah, it is brutal. And yeah, that the marriages that survive and last and are healthy seems, seem to be in the minority status. But I want to tell you something today. I believe that God has a design and a purpose to make marriages exceptional. I speak from the Word of God, and I speak from 30 years of experience. I've been married 30 years. This June, it'll be, no, 31 years. Wow. Uh, 31 years. I've been married 31 years. Yeah, that's a long time to be married. Whoa, I must have married my wife at 12. I don't know. Um, Many years of marriage. I've, I've married hundreds of couples. I've counseled also hundreds and hundreds of couples. And so I have a lot of experience at dealing with couples, marrying couples, and being married myself. But my authority this morning comes from one place, and that's the authority of the Word of God. And so I want to talk to you about that because I don't know your 
status today. But I do believe that God has something powerful to say to you today. And I want to turn your attention to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to begin reading in verse 22. There's almost not a week that goes by in my ministry that I'm not dealing with someone that's having a major crisis in their marriage. Major crisis. One of the greatest requests that we get in the office for counseling has to do with marriage. We're separated. We're not getting along. I'm ready to abandon this. We're having problems. We can't communicate. Feel like I'm married to an ice cube. Feel like he doesn't listen. Feel like our kids are in the middle of this. We're really not sure what to do. But I want to tell you this. I want you to remember this statement I'm about to tell you. I believe that we cannot, we cannot trust the design unless, first of all, we trust the designer. The guy that invented marriage, came up with marriage, is not an institutional creation. This was God's design. He engineered it, created it. He put the pieces together. He knows how it works best. And so therefore, we need to go back to the original designer and say, hey, if you know how it works best, then teach us. We want to follow your pattern, the pattern that's revealed in Scripture Not society's pattern, not society's distortion, but God, we want to follow your pattern when it comes to Scripture, a marriage. And I believe that a lot of people are in the situation they're at because we've listened to the distortion of culture, their definition of marriage, rather than God's definition of marriage. Now, I have to give you a warning in advance. What I'm about to teach you will step on some people's toes bad. What I'm about to teach you, for some of you, it's going to make you want to walk out of this auditorium. In fact, some of you, when you heard what I was talking about this morning, already said, I wonder if I can escape by going to the bathroom and just slipping out the back door if no one will notice. But you are here, and I believe God wants to speak to you, okay? So let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. And first of all, by the way, I'm going to start with you ladies. You say, well, why are you picking on us, Pastor? Because Scripture starts with the ladies first. It says, and by the way, it says, be filled with the Spirit. First of all, it tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Submit to one another out of the reverence of Christ. In verse 22, it addresses the wives. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And all the wives in here are saying, amen, or woe is me, or pastor, I don't like that. So let's talk about this for a second. Hey, I get more bristling out of this passage than almost any passage in Scripture. For the men, it's the only, I know some men that it's the only passage they know out of the whole Bible. They've memorized it, outlined it, earmarked their Bible in it, and they know this one verse out of all the verses in Scripture. So let me talk to you about this. I believe that we have to go back to God's design, right? And um, the design that God has is not always the easy design. This says... Two things you're going to emphasize in this scripture. Wives, honor and support the leadership of your husband. And husbands, demonstrate affectionate, nurturing love to your wives. That's the main pillars that are left, that are put in this passage. You know, I have with me here a set of drawings. These are architectural drawings for this building. We're doing construction. Now, let me tell you something about these drawings. I trust these drawings because I knew I know who drew them. A structural engineer actually came up with these, and I'm really glad that it was an expert structural engineer that came up with these drawings. If not, I would say, well, I don't know if I should trust this because, hey, 
you know, I, I'm not sure if these drawings are to be trusted. I want you to take a look for a moment with me to that big beam that you see right over here on the right side of the auditorium. Do you see that big beam going from this side of the auditorium all the way to the other side of the auditorium? Do you see that? That was installed last week. Some of you under it, I know want to move over right now. That's a huge beam. Now, we installed that beam because there was a pillar in the middle of the sanctuary and it obstructed view. And so we decided we're going to put a beam in there, but it was a structural engineer expert that has spent years and years in school, studied it, and he didn't just say, hey, yeah, I just throw it up there. I think it'll work. He said, let's test the soil. So right over there, they tested the soil to see if it was sinking or not sinking. He said, we need to sure up the foundation. So we dug a hole around the foundation of that pillar and put extra cement there. He said, the beam needs to be stronger. And so we welded metal plates against that beam so that it would be thicker. We did the same thing on the other side. And then they took this 80-foot beam, and they brought it into the sanctuary through that door over there, and they hoisted it up, and they welded it, and they're not saying, hey, you know, I hope it holds up for a couple of years. They're saying, this will hold 100% guaranteed because it was, it was studied. The architect is a structural engineer that put it together, trust the design because an expert designer put it together. Now, I could have said, you know, I don't think it's a big deal. We'll get some guys that are looking for work on the corner out there and say, what do you think? Can you throw a beam up there? We'll save a lot of money if we did. And they said, yeah, I think it'll hold. Let me just grab some beams, put some, weld it together. And no, 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 no. That would be dangerous. We have an expert that designed it, and so we trust the plans... We trust the design because we know the designer. I'm asking you this morning to do the same thing with marriage. It may be difficult. It may seem challenging. But I want you to trust the design because we know the designer. His name is God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. The very first thing that he says to the wise is this. He says, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. I believe that the greatest need that your husband has, that guy sitting beside you, he may be 250 pounds, bolted up, tatted up, tough guy, but I'm going to tell you, he needs something desperately from you. He may not look like it on the outside. You may think, ah, he doesn't need anything from me. But I'm going to tell you, your husband desperately needs this from you if you are married to him. Your husband desperately needs to sense that you support him and that you respect and back his leadership. In fact, the, the word that's used here in the Greek is actually a military term and ranking. If anybody has been in the military, they understand that there are generals and that there are colonels and that there are sergeants. There's a ranking order there. And if someone has a higher rank, then those that are under that rank say, okay, this is the leader of the platoon. It doesn't mean that that leader is smarter, better, has more worth. It simply means that in function, they are in charge. And so God, when he's speaking to wives and husbands, he's saying, wives, I want you to understand that in the design of the family, I have asked, I have designed it as the husband taking headship over the family. That means that that husband, it is his responsibility to carry the leadership of that household and family forward in a God-ordained way. You say, wait a second, pastor, you don't know my husband. You see, I'm smarter than he is. He's not a good leader. And so because he's not good at it, I've just decided to take over it because I think it could be run a lot better. Well, you know what? You have to trust God's design because he is the designer. 
Amen? Now, I'm not saying you're not smarter than your husband. You may be. I'm not saying that you're not a better leader because some of you could be much better leaders than your husband. But I'm saying that you need to follow God's design, and in God's order and design, he has placed the responsibility of leading the family up squarely upon the shoulders of your husband. It's a, it's a thing of function, and it's a role. Let me, tell, let me explain a little bit what that means. So what it means is he says, I want wives to submit yourself to your husband as to the Lord. What does that mean, that your husband is the same place as the Lord? No, it simply means that as you submit yourself to your husband and his leadership and back and support his leadership, what you're saying is, I'm not doing this because he's smarter, stronger, brighter, bigger, more gifted, but I'm doing this because I'm trusting God to lead my household through his leadership. So I'm submitting myself to the Lord, and as I submit myself to the Lord, I'm supporting, backing, and respecting the leadership of my husband. Now, in a day and age in which roles have been erased, for some of you, you're like, Pastor, that's crazy. For some of you, that's like shocking. Like, are you really telling me that? Listen, I'm trusting the designer and the design that the designer has come up with. I didn't write it. I'm just preaching it, right? And so here's what it means. As you study scripture, here's the things that I believe that it's telling us. Number one, I I, I love the way that Dr. Emerson Egrich, who wrote a book called Love and Respect, how he talks about it. He says what happens in a lot of cases is that a lot of couples find themselves in a really bad cycle. He calls the cycle the crazy cycle. Here's what I've noticed in counseling a lot. The greatest need that, a, that, that most men have in their marriage is I need to be supported. I need to be respected. I feel like I need my wife to say I believe in your leadership. I need her to say I'm with you. I need her to say, hey, I'm a fan of what you're doing. I'm, I, I support what you're doing. I'm behind you. I, believe, I, I, I encourage you. I believe that God has put you in that position. And most women, what they really need is to feel loved for and cared for, that their husband says, hey, I care about you. I love you. I nurture you. Your feelings are important to me. Your life is important to me. And so when a husband feels the support and respect of his wife, and the wife feels the love and nurturing of her husband, then there's this incredible, powerful cycle that's an energizing cycle. Marriage is not draining, but it's empowering. You're saying, I love to be married. This is awesome. But in the crazy cycle, what happens is that a husband says, you know what, my wife, she's like against every idea that I have. I walk in the household and already it's... Nothing that I do is okay. Everything is wrong. She resists everything. She's against everything. I feel like she's opposed to me every single way, every single day. And then she wonders why she doesn't feel loved. When she starts respecting me, backing me, supporting me, affirming me, then I'm going to love her. But I'm waiting for her to respect me. And the wife is saying, oh, yeah, he wants me to respect him. I feel like his buddies are more important. I feel like his work's more important. I feel like the television is more important. I feel like everything is more important than me. Pastor, you should have seen us when we were dating. Man, he was all over it. Flowers and cards and music and baby, what do you want? And what can I do? Sitting next next to me, arm around me all the time. Once he put a ring on my finger, it's like, I got her. Now I can move on. So when he starts... When he starts showing me a little bit love, then I'm going to show him a little respect. And so you're in a crazy cycle. You're waiting for your spouse to change. And as long as they don't change, you don't give them what they need. They don't give you what you need. And you're in this crazy, 
broken, dysfunctional cycle where your emotions are setting down, where you're angry with each other. Some people live in their household, but you're more like roommates than you are married people. Some of you have shut down emotionally, and it's an ice woman and an ice man. You don't have, you have very little affection, and you're just hanging on to the day that your kids graduate, and then you say, you know, I'm out of here. And by the way, no one talked to me about your marriage. I know some of you are saying, who talked to me, pastor? Someone told you. No, 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 no. What God is saying is that doesn't have to live that way. There can be another cycle, an energizing cycle. How does that work, ladies, with your husband? Let me give you some just practical. This is where the rubber meets the road. You ready, ladies? You don't seem very excited about it, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Like, okay. How does your husband feel respected and supported and backed? Number one, find opportunities to honor and build up your husband. Find opportunities to say, hey, yeah, he's a good man. To honor him and to build him up. Serious, ladies. When is the last time? You've built up your husband. When's the last time you said, honey, I just want to tell you, I really appreciate how hard you work. You know, I really love the fact that you went out and played with Junior. Hey, I really appreciate the fact that you, the way you love your mom and take care of her and honor, it really means something. Hey, I really appreciate the fact, when's the last time that you've built him up? When's the last time that you've given words of affirmation and let them know, you know, I'm a lucky woman, blessed woman to be married to you. Think about it for a second. When's the last time? Oh, he knows that already. Listen, I know there's a problem when I sit in my counseling office and I'll see two couples. I could tell by their body posture how they're doing already. Sitting on the extreme of the couch. How are you guys doing? Okay. And I'll say, sometimes to break up the ice a little bit, I'll say, because they'll start off everything they're unhappy about, discontent, why they're mad at each other, why they think this marriage is not going to work. And sometimes I'll stop and say, hey, I'll tell the wife, hey, can you tell me what attracted you to this man in the beginning? What are some of the good qualities that you see and drew you together? And she'll sit there and go, um, uh, well, um, and I know, you know, you have been focusing so long on what's wrong that you can't even think of what's right. And let me tell you, have you ever been around someone that you feel like is constantly on your case, constantly looking at what you're doing wrong? Have you ever had a boss that was always looking at what you did wrong and could never give you a high five, never told you what you did right, that you felt like everything, he's always nagging you? Do you want to be around that person? No. Some of your husbands feel that way. Like, I never hear one good compliment, one word of affirmation. So, you know, he stays out in the bar as long as he can. Gets done from work, goes and hangs out in the bar a little bit. You say, what are you doing? He's just gaining courage to go home because he knows he's going to have to face it. So he gets loosened up. After two hours there, he finally shows up and all it all comes at him. Why didn't you do this? Where were you? How you doing? How come you're not this? Junior did that. The house isn't this. You need to make more money. Your mother-in-law doesn't do this. And you know what? There needs to be uh, the power of affirmation coming from you. So number one, you need to find opportunities to build and honor your husband. Number two, focus on what your husband does well. What is it that your husband does well? Focus on what he does well. You know, there's a lot of things I don't do well. But my wife, I know she looks for things I do well. Don't ask me to work on the electrical in the house. It's a dangerous thing. I did a while back. I tried to mess around with a switch that wasn't working. My wife walked in. She slipped, flipped, flipped the switch, and the lights upstairs went on. She said, is it supposed to work this way? I said, well, I don't know. It was a three-way. I didn't understand the three-way. I just know a two-way. She said, well, how do you turn it off? I said, well, you got to go upstairs and turn it off. 
I could tell she was trying to affirm my effort. And she says, well, you know, honey, you're a good preacher. I said, well, thank you, honey. I appreciate the words of affirmation. Find something, focus on what your husband does well and seek to affirm him in what he does well. Number three, speak positive of your husband to others. There's something, there's something powerful about you speaking positive to others about your husband. You know, when you get together with the girls, it shouldn't be a husband bashing party. It shouldn't be, well, yeah, your husband, my husband does this, you know, and you, every, when your husband walks in, they're all looking at him like, yeah, you? Everything gets quiet and everybody gives them a mean look. You know, you should, there's something about, listen, there's something about affirming your husband, especially in front of other people. There's something powerful when you say words of affirmation in front of other people. You say, well, he's not a little boy. You know what? He may be a big guy, but in his heart, he needs a fan. I've told my wife this a hundred times. I told her, you know what? The world can be coming against us. There can be crisis all over, people that turn their backs on you. But, you know, there's one thing I need to know. First of all, I need to know that I'm secure in Jesus and that I have the favor of God. That's like number one. But the second thing I need to know, I need to know that my wife is my fan. I, I, I need to know if, if God and my wife are for me, man, we got it. There's something powerful about knowing that there's a woman in your corner saying, hey, I believe in you. Hey, I'm with you. Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm on your side. And I'm affirming that to other people around. There's something incredibly powerful about a man who has a wife that's his number one fan. Number four, encourage your husband when he takes initiative. I'm talking about how to practically show respect. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies of the male leadership in this nation at the time is the tragedy of male passivity. In fact, I believe that that's one of the greatest curses that God had to deal with in the beginning. If you read Genesis, you realize that the fall of man came because the woman took initiative and she... She took initiative in the wrong direction. And when she offered the apple to Adam, instead of Adam saying, hey, babe. Hey, baby. No, 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 no. Let's follow God together. No, no, no. That's wrong for you. Let's not do this. I'm, you know, our marriage, we're going to follow God's direction. Instead of taking initiative, instead of stepping in, Adam went, uh, okay. And, and, and he, he ate of the apple when she took initiative instead of taking spiritual initiative in the household. And therefore, their entire, their entire uh, generation had affected their kids. And we're still suffering some of the effects of male passivity. Let me tell you something, men. I believe that God has called you to be a leader. And we'll get to it in a second what it means to be a servant leader. But God has called you to, to take initiative, to be a leader. And ladies, there's nothing that causes respect to grow in your heart and towards your husband like affirming his initiative. If your husband is a baby believer and you've been a Christian for a long time, listen, when he gathers the family around and awkwardly says, okay, we're going to bless the food, and I'm not really good at praying, but I'm going to try to pray. And he prays a prayer and stumbles around a little bit and fumbles his words and doesn't end in Jesus' name. When he ends the prayer, don't say, you know what, you should have ended in Jesus' name. And we're eating carrots, not broccoli. You prayed for broccoli. It's carrots here. You know, don't affirm his initiative. Put your arm around him and say, you know, it's, hey, it's so sexy being married to a godly man. Let him know that you're affirming his initiative. When he takes step to lead the family, steps to uh, take initiative towards the things of God, affirm him, back him, let him know that because that will cause him and encourage him to take greater steps in the, of initiative as well. Number five, tell your children the positive aspects of their dad's character 
both as a husband and as a father. Listen, one of the worst things that you could do is badmouth your husband to your kids. I hope you never grow up to be like him. Oh, you're just like your father. And not in a good way. Your kids need to hear you saying, that's your dad. I love him. Your dad works hard. Hey, we're grateful we have that man as, as, the, as a provider in this household. Or you're grateful. Hey, thank God you guys have a father like him because a lot of kids don't have a father. You need to be affirming before your kids the fact that the father that you have. I'm so grateful for my wife that I, over the years, I've only heard her say positive things to my kids over and over and over about me. I've heard her... When she, was, when she didn't know I was listening, I've heard her say, well, your dad does this, your dad, you know, you need to be thankful, you need to, I've heard her say it over and over, wives, there's something powerful, you're showing respect to your husband when you affirm him before your children, it's a powerful way of showing respect towards him. And then lastly, <clears throat> but not least, number six, remember that your touch and affection tells your husband he's important. Something about showing physical affection to your husband that tells him, you're important to me. I value you. I'm, when you move, put your hand over to touch me, I don't go like this. I actually show affection. I actually initiate affection. I actually let you know that you are important to me and I value you as well. And so... The first thing that the Bible says is, wives, submit yourself to your husbands as to the Lord, because God has called them to lead the household. So your responsibility towards your husband is, how can I support him? How can I affirm him? How can I back him? How can he know that I'm in his corner and I affirm his leadership with all of that what's within me because it brings out the best in my husband? Now, it's the man's turn. How many of the wives say amen to that? <clears throat> then the Bible turns its attention to the wives. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or other blemish, but holy and blameless. Verse 28, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. Let me pause there for a second. Let me say that it's not that husbands aren't to respect their wives. It's that the greatest need of your husband is your respect, and the greatest need of your wife is your love. And I want to talk to you for a moment, men, about what it means to literally love your wives. Because I believe that probably a lot of men in this auditorium, if I were to say, do you love your wife? You say, of course I love my wife. Sure, I love her. I heard one guy say, he was with a counselor. The counselor said, do you love your wife? Yeah, I love her. Well, how come you never tell her? He said, you know, when I, we got married, I told her I love her. If anything changes, I'll let her know. But let me tell you something. The greatest need that your wife has, the greatest need that she has, is that she needs to have this sense that she is important to you. And there's, we, the Bible refers to it as love, but she needs to know that you care about her emotions, you care about her heart, that you, that she is important, that she ranks really high, and that you are nurturing and caring and loving her in a way that values her high above everything else in life except for God. And then the Bible tells you how you, how you are to love. It says, number one, love is Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Christ loved the church enough to sacrifice his life for the church. So when you are understand that you're the leader, 
It's not about pounding your chest like King Kong and saying, I lead this house. It's about doing what Jesus did. Jesus was a servant leader. Jesus was the Messiah, yet with his disciples, the Bible says that he, he put the towel around his waist and he got on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet, even though he was Jesus the Christ. And when it came the time, Jesus sacrificed himself on a cross. He gave his own, very own life for the people that he loved. So it's a sacrificial love. Secondly, he says, love your wife as you love your body. So the way that you love your body, you take care of yourself. When you're hungry, you go eat. When your stomach's growling, you say, well, Pastor, I don't really take good care of myself. Yeah, but sometimes you pamper your body. Your stomach starts growling. Is my stomach saying Portillo's hamburgers? I hear it. You drive through Portillo's hamburgers. You get a hamburger. You, you, you take care of yourself. And so the Bible is telling you, he's telling men, we need to love our wives sacrificially. And secondly, we need to love our wives sensitively. In other words, looking to see what those needs are in their life. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And I'm going to give you some practical ways of loving your wife. And I have to admit that it, 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 it has taken me a while to learn how to love my wife really in the way that she wants to be loved. Because sometimes we love, we, we try to show love to other people the way uh, we want to be loved, but their love language is different than ours. So uh, Dr. Egrich, who wrote Love and Respect, he has a simple acronym that he gives to how men should love their wives. So men, I want you to listen up here. This is what your wife looks for. C-O-U-P-L-E. Close, closeness, openness, understanding, peacemaking, loyalty, and esteem. And I'm going to break that down real fast. Number one, closeness. Your wife, if you want to love her, your wife desires to be close emotionally to you. Relationally and intimately. And by intimately, I mean not only sex. By intimately, I mean that your wife wants to feel... I, I talk to so many couples, and the wife, when she really is open, she will say, I feel very distant from my husband. What is she saying? She's simply saying, I don't feel like my husband lets me into his life. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what he's feeling. I feel like he holds me away. I asked, so how was work? Good. How are you feeling about your new job? Okay. How's the relationship with your mother going? Fine. And I hear wives saying, you know, I want to know what he's going through. I want to hear his heart. I want to know his struggle. I feel like we're two strangers living in a house together because he doesn't let me in. And so part of the way you love your wife is by letting down some of those barriers and actually talking to her about what you're going through and expressing to her what's happening in your heart. There's a conversation that happens, a dialogue that happens that allows your wife to feel close to you. Number two, openness. When you're open about your ideas, your struggles, your dreams... When you don't hold her at bay, but you're actually opening up your heart and sharing with her things, sharing with her first before you share with your friends and buddies and other people, sharing with her what's really on your heart, what you're really excited about, but actually dialoguing and talking not just about facts, but about how you feel and revealing your heart in a powerful way. That's openness. Thirdly, understanding. What your wife really wants from you is she wants to know that you understand her. Not just fix her, but understand her. It took me a, while, a long time to figure this out with my wife. I would come home and my wife wanted to tell me about some drama that was happening, people, a struggle that she was going through, some relational issue, and she'd go on and on and talk to me and explain it for 45 minutes 
or I would interrupt her 10 minutes into it. And I say, that's simple. Let me give you three solutions. Number one, you need to do this. Number two, you need to do this. Number three, you need to do that. Done. Simple. Let's not talk about it anymore. Very simple solution. And she would get mad at me. And in my male mind, I couldn't figure out why she mad at me. I just gave her great steps to fix the problem. It took me a while to discover she wasn't asking for solutions. She wasn't really looking for me to fix the problem. What she really wanted is she wanted me to understand the frustration of her heart, the sadness that it brought, the struggle that she was going through. It took me a while to figure out that what she really wanted is me to listen to what she was going through. And so instead of me saying, well, one, two, three, I needed to learn to say, oh, mm, wow, I'm sorry. And how did that make you feel? Um, she didn't want me to fix it. She wanted to know that I understood what she was going through. Wives, how many of you know that that's true? Okay. <laughs> Number four, peacemaking. I'm talking to you about how you love your wife. Peacemaking. Many of the wives feel loved if they understand that their husband, once in a while, when they're wrong, can take responsibility for what they've done and said, I am sorry. I was wrong. Let me tell you. Men, we are notorious for having a hard time saying, I'm sorry. I think we should practice it at least one time, guys. How about it? Let's just, if you're a man in this place, I want to hear male voices say, I am sorry. I, I had about half participation. Some of you are like, ah, <clears throat> I'm not going to do that. That, that. Don't say I'm sorry. Come on. All together, you're a man in the place. Let's practice saying, I am sorry. Some of you are still choking on that a bit because those words are very dusty in your vocabulary. You're like, I can't remember the last time I said that. But there is something powerful about acknowledging, I am sorry. I should not have blown my temper. The words that I spoke were damaging words. Will you forgive me? That was wrong. Some wives live almost their entire married life without ever hearing their husband take responsibility for damaging words, for explosive tempers, for bad choices being made, and they seldom hear that. And so oftentimes they build up a resentment towards their husband because they feel like you never settle the issue. You never acknowledge you're wrong. You just walk away, wait till it blows over. Then you want to come at night and say, hey, babe, how you doing? You want to kiss? And you're like, no. And they're like, why not? And you think to yourself, you don't get it, do you? You just did all that. I'm mad at you. And now you want me to be this hot babe in love with you. It doesn't work that way. And sometimes they just need to hear, I'm sorry, there's a power in taking responsibility for bad choices and decisions. Next, loyalty, L. She needs to know that you are committed to her. There's security in your future. You reaffirm your love to her. Your wife needs to know she is the woman in your life. Can I tell you something, husbands? Let me, let me just say, let, let me give you a little pet peeve of mine. I can't think of a bigger disrespect to be sitting in a restaurant with your wife and some young thing letting all her stuff hang out walks by and you're like, hmm. And then your wife, and you say, what? Listen, I want to slap you. I want to slap you and say, how can you disrespect that woman that's in front of you? You're with the woman. Get your eyes on your woman. Maybe you say, I'm not doing really anything. I'm just looking. I'm just appreciating beauty. You got, you got someone around you. No greater disrespect, no greater disrespect than to be eyeballing some other woman 
that walks by or your hand, you know, walking, looking, a wandering eye, making flirtatious comments when your woman is right there. Your desire, your eyes, your affection, your compliments should go to the one woman that you have. The loyalty should be there. The affirmation should be there. It goes to her. Yeah, but pastor, you know, she let herself kind of go down the hill a little bit. Hey, have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? Because, you know, it's not like she's the only one that's gotten a little older. Hey, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Your affection needs to go towards her. Your wife needs to know that she's secure in your love. One of the greatest ways that you could love her is, is building that sense of security, that you're with it through the thick and thin, difficulty, hard time, no matter what. When, when people move in and out of houses, you create an insecurity. When people talk about their options, well, you know, I could have dated so-and-so, you know. That woman, she still calls me up and wants I've said no to her, but just give me one more reason and I'm going to go. You know what? You are creating in yourself an insecurity and damaging your relationship. And lastly, esteem. E stands for esteem. Honor and cherish her. Speak highly of her. Notice her. No put downs. You know, I, I know some of you may do this, and, you know, if your wife's okay with this, I'm okay. But, I, you know, I don't like the term my old lady. Well, my old lady, I, I'm wondering if your wife really likes it too. I'm convinced that you need to refer to her in ways that build up her esteem. Men are notorious to getting together and, you know, it's funny to you to bash your wife to make, you know, overweight jokes and cooking jokes and this jokes and throw it down and everybody laughs and she laughs a little bit. But when she walks away from that, she's not laughing on the inside. She feels like, you know, all I got all evening was jokes about me and who I am. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, there's a, there's a power in loving your wife by, by when is the last time, men, when is the last time? That when your buddies were around, when family was around, when your family was around, that you publicly acknowledged how much you love your wife or value her, esteem her in front of others. There's something powerful about you acknowledging the worth and value of your wife in front of others. Well, I know you like to whisper sweet nothings right when you're getting her in the mood, and that's fine. But you know what? I think your wife would be a lot more happier if it wasn't getting her in the mood and you just acknowledge in front of everybody how you are committed to your wife, how you love her, how she is the one that you're for. There's something powerful about that when you respect and honor and love her that way. And then he tells us in verse 31, For this is the reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. When you marry someone, the Bible says that you are one flesh. What you do affects that person. What that person does affects you. You're one. In fact, you are one flesh, but you are an example to the world out there of what Christ is to the church. I'm going to tell you something. There's no more powerful testimony than a marriage where people have been together for a long time, get, been through some good times and some bad times, but they love each other deeply. There's no more powerful testimony to your children. There's no more powerful testimony to a world out there to see two people that have, two imperfect people that are working through their issues and loving one another the way that Christ has called you to love one another.